and a big thank you to all for watching the first edition of Masterclass Ultrasound Quiz. Thank you for your valuable feedback. These are indeed difficult times. Please do take care. In this next edition, we concentrate on pediatric ultrasound. Hello and welcome to this edition of Master Class Ultrasound Quiz. The theme for this quiz being Pediatric Ultrasound. So let's quiz. Case number one. A young boy with right scrotal swelling presenting for ultrasound. Ultrasound obviously reveals scrotal hydrocele. But then in the sagittal section, you can see that there is fluid in the right inguinal region as well. Of course, there is fluid in the hemiscrotum and there is fluid in the inguinal region as well. So we are dealing with, so irrespective of the specific diagnosis that you give, what we are dealing here is basically a type of a communicating hydrocele, right? A communicating hydrocele is due to the failure of the processus vaginalis to close completely. And when we state this, it is obvious that we are going to deal with a spectrum of clinical presentations and therefore a spectrum of ultrasound findings. For example, in an encysted hydrocele of the cord, fluid does not communicate with the peritoneum above or with the tunica vaginalis below. And this is a very common presentation which presents as a inguinal lump or as an inguinal swelling. And in that spectrum uh, of finding, we would call it an encysted hydrocele of the cord. A slightly different spectrum or a slightly different presentation would be a funicular hydrocele. Now, in a funicular hydrocele, this is obviously a type of communicating hydrocele where the fluid collection communicates with the peritoneum above at the internal inguinal ring but does not communicate with the tunica vaginalis. So there is no scrotal component, but rather there is more of an inguinal component, which however does communicate with the peritoneum above and therefore is reducible, unlike an encysted hydrocele of the cord. Now sometimes you can see debris or echoes within the fluid. Mind you, this can often be a normal thing simply because of the long-standing nature of the fluid collection and does not necessarily mean that you know you are dealing with an emergency or an infection or something like that and obviously if the uh, processes is patent can a hernia be far behind so sometimes there might also be an associated inguinal hernia now differentiation of a funicular hydrocele from a simple scrotal hydrocele is essential since management is obviously different Case number two, a 14 year old boy had presented to me with an abnormal LFT to perform an ultrasound of the abdomen to basically look at the liver. Now, while he did have very specific features which would suggest an hepatitis such as, you know, hepatomegaly, uh, thickening of wall of the gallbladder, what was a surprising finding was this mass, which as you can see, is anterior and just medial to the left kidney. The mass is about say 9 by 8 centimeters in size, extremely inhomogeneous and you can see multiple hyperechoic foci within consistent with calcifications. So a 14 year old boy with an incidental detection of a mass related to the left kidney but separate from it as you can see here, growing medially practically encasing the renal vessel and extending anterior to the aorta. So what could this be? The thought process here is that the first thing is that when you get a pediatric case with a mass related to the kidney, that is, you start thinking in terms of a neuroblastoma. That's the kind of association. Neuroblastoma is the most common solid extracranial malignant tumor in children and in fact forms about 8 to 10 percent of all pediatric malignancies. It is common in the 1 to 5 years age group. Neuroblastomas arise either in the adrenal medulla or anywhere along the sympathetic ganglion chain and the average size is about 8 cm at presentation which our mass seem to uh, fit rather well. In older children, other neural crest tumors such as ganglioneuroblastoma and ganglioneuroma are more common and these are more common in the first and the second decades of life. These also present as solid masses, homogeneous or heterogeneous 
with or without areas of calcification and pheochromocytoma is another differential diagnosis that we must keep in mind. In this particular case, it turned out to be a ganglioneuroma and that seemed to fit rather well with the fact that, you know, it was an older child, a 14-year-old boy uh, who had presented incidentally with that mass. Case number three, a small girl who presented with dysuria and, you know, symptoms suggesting uh, increased urinary frequencies, what you call the lower urinary tract symptoms, maybe there was a little fever and this was the ultrasound appearance. There was no hematuria. So what could this be? Cystitis as we generally define as when the bladder wall shows a diffuse thickening which is more than 3 millimeters. But rarely cystitis produces focal wall thickening or a polypoid mass as was in this case which can be thought of as an inflammatory pseudotumor. Right? So this was a slightly atypical presentation of cystitis, what one could call an inflammatory pseudotumor. Now, while this particular case wasn't a cystitis cystica, which is an inflammatory process localized to the trigone and urethral orifices, it is a broad-based irregular isoechoic or hyperechoic soft tissue mass, which could mimic a rhabdomyosarcoma, and that is another type of a focal cystitis. Case number four. I don't need to, you know, describe this. This is a spotter. Here's a neonate and uh, this is the liver and you can see something so do you already have the diagnosis in case you don't here's the clue there's the pylorus there's the distended stomach which is fluid filled yes and now coming back to our original slide with the measurements in this case you can see that the pylorus has an overall measurement of about 1.5 centimeters and a muscle thickness of almost 5 millimeters or 0 0.5 centimeters. In the longitudinal section, you can see that the pylorus is elongated just over 17 millimeters and you can see the red arrow pointing out to a small prolapse of the pyloric channel mucosa into the stomach. This is called the antral nipple sign and you can see the black arrow pointing out to some hypoechoic or fluid clefts within the pyloric channel. So do you have the answer now, right? Hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. The first picture showed us the olive shaped mass in the epigastrium. Presentation is about two to six weeks of life. non bilious projectile vomiting is how the neonate presents. And as we showed in our slides, thickened pyloric muscle greater than equal to three millimeters and elongated pyloric channel greater than equal to 17 millimeters. The antral nipple sign, which we showed in the trade arrow, prolapse of pyloric channel mucosa into the gastric antrum, and the double track sign due to hypoechoic stripes of fluid within the crevices of the mucosa. Sometimes the thickened pyloric muscle reveals increased flow on Doppler. And if you uh, ask a question as to post Ramstead procedure, how long would this thickening persist? Then the muscle may appear abnormally thick for three months post-surgery as well. So that does not necessarily mean that there is failure of the surgery. Case number five. A four-year-old girl presented with this left inguinal lump. Now this child was absolutely asymptomatic. It was her mother who was agitated. She was very sure that just the day prior when she bathed the child, everything was absolutely normal. And the child was playful, went around to the playground, played for some time, came back. And it was in the evening that she noticed that the child had a lump in the left inguinal region. The child was asymptomatic. These are the ultrasound features. You can see that there is an anechoic cyst in the left inguinal region. In this slide, you can see the relationship to the urinary bladder. So what are we dealing with? If you had stated that this was a hydrocele or a cyst of the canal of Nook, you would be absolutely correct. This is again like in the first case of the young boy due to a failure of the complete obliteration of the canal of Nook, which is the patent peritoneal pouch in a girl. This is the patent peritoneal pouch extending anterior to the round ligament and into the labia majora. And hence it is indeed another patent processes for journalists 
And due to this patency, you can either get an encysted hydrocele, as you see in this case, or even a hernia. Because if there is a patent processus, then the ovary or even the fallopian tube may herniate into this canal. Here is another case. This one was on the right side, the right inguinal region. You can see in this section its relationship to the right iliac vessels. It is medial to the iliac vessels. And in this particular case, you can see the herniation of ovary into the patent processes. Case number six. An eight-year-old boy complaining of vomiting and severe pain in the abdomen presenting with a lump. This is the transverse section of the lump. I'm sure most of you must already have had the diagnosis by now. Yet another view of the lump. So what were we dealing with? Intersusception, that's right. Intersusception is common in children more than three months and that's because it's most frequently related to enlarged lymphoid tissue post-infection. Since prior to three months of life, immunity is passive, it's logical that it's going to be common after the age of three months. Now, when the diameter is more than 2.5 of the lump, that is, and the length of the lump is more than 5 centimeters, then an ileocolic type of an intersusception is more likely than an ileoileal. And it is this differentiation that is very important. Another feature is that there is an ecogenic fat core in all cases of ileocolic, whereas ileoileal show little or no fat. And therefore, the fat core to outer wall thickness index, if that's greater than 1, then this is supposed to be 100% sensitive and specific for an ileocolic type of intersusception. Here's another example. This child again presented with severe pain and vomiting. And I, I saw this insisted fluid collection in the left abdomen. It did not have that typical findings of intersusception in this section. But on transverse section, it indeed turns out to have very characteristic features suggesting an intersusception. So what was this fluid? This fluid was basically a sign of this intersusception gone bad and that thick segment of intestine that you saw within the fluid collection was the segment of bowel inside which had become gangrenous. So case number seven, a young girl presenting with lower urinary tract symptoms and a palpable lump. So what is this? This is again a spotter. Here's the lump, right? If you called it either as a hydrocolpus or a hematocolpus, you would be correct because this can either be encountered in the neonatal period or at the time of menarche. The presentation could be as a palpable mass or very rarely as an interlabial mass in neonates due to eversion of the obstructing membrane or septum. Patients could present with cyclical pain, noting the relationship of the cystic mass to the urinary bladder, it is very easy to imagine that urinary retention could be a very common presentation. Generally, transabdominal ultrasound suffices for the diagnosis, but a transperineal scan can measure the distance between the perineum and the caudal margin of the cyst. Next case. These are ultrasound images showing us the right and the left hip of a young child. You can see the right hip and the left hip. These are images of the same patient of the right and the left hips. I'm sure that most of you already have the diagnosis. Here is another patient. Again, images of the right hip and the left hip. So what are we dealing with? Detection of fluid in the anterior recess of the hip joint. Let's not come to the specific diagnosis, right? What did, what did those ultrasound images reveal? Detection of fluid in the anterior recess of the hip joint. Now, ultrasound is highly sensitive and as little as 1 ml of fluid can be detected. Now, the specific diagnosis or the causes can vary. You can have a transient synovitis, in which case the fluid is more likely to be anechoic as it was in our cases, in osteomyelitis, perthase, in slipped capital epiphysis, in fractures, in arthritis, the fluid is more likely to have ecogenic debris within the collection. Always, in as we do in all musculoskeletal cases, Compare the two sides and what is important is that you use an anterior oblique plane. Now the anterior recess has a capsule which parallels the neck. 
the normal capsule has a thickness of about 2 to 5 millimeters and the difference between the two sides is less than 2 millimeters implying thereby that if the capsule is thickened beyond 5 millimeters or if the difference between the two sides is greater than 2 millimeters then you should consider that it is an abnormal appearance. So the normal appearance would, of the capsule would be that of a concave capsule parallel to the neck. If it is convex then that is abnormal. Now to come to that positioning of the transducer. Now I told you that the normal plane is slightly oblique to the shaft of the femur. So rather than keeping the transducer placed like this, this is how you could place it, in which case you would get a very perfect section of the anterior recess of the hip joint. Case number nine, a neonate, we are looking at the cranium and we are looking at the coronal planes. You can see some numbers three or four. So generally the way to do a cranial ultrasound through the fontanelle is to obtain coronal and sagittal and parasagittal and steep parasagittal sections, right? Now you could, depending on the kind of protocol that you use, you could have about six coronal sections or eight coronal sections. What is important is that in the coronal section labeled three, you can see the third ventricle and you can see that there are echogenic masses in the floor of the lateral ventricle, right, which are bilateral. Parasagittal sections revealed, there are echogenic masses, which you can see extending from the choroid plexus anteriorly. Now, there was a clue. What are we dealing with? Obviously, germinal matrix hemorrhage or chordothalamic hemorrhage, which occurs in the stress-sensitive highly vascular germinal matrix in the chordothalamic groove. Now, why was that subtle emphasis on the anterior extension of the choroid plexus? That is because the normal choroid plexus does not extend anterior to the chordothalamic groove and we will come to that in the next slide. Now, since the germinal matrix matures by 34 weeks, this hemorrhage is rare after 34 weeks. So it is basically more common in prematures. Most occur in the first week of life and there are four grades according to Papil and in grade four you can see extension into the brain tissue. Let's run across some slides here. Now this is that explanation. The thinner arrow roughly points to the position of the chordothalamic groove. The normal choroid plexus never extends anterior to it. So when you see something that looks like a choroid plexus anteriorly, that is anterior to the chordothalamic groove, in this given clinical setting, it is almost surely hemorrhage in the germinal matrix. Now, depending on the age of the bleed, you can have different appearances. An older bleed would have this kind of a cystic appearance and bleed into the ventricle would sometimes appear as you can see here as an apparent enlargement or a dense appearing choroid plexus. On this side you can see that there is ventriculomegaly along with a apparently enlarged choroid plexus telling us that there is an intraventricular hemorrhage as well with an associated ventricular enlargement and this would be what grade? Grade 3 type of hemorrhage. And in this slide, you can see intraparenchymal bleed, obviously a grade 4 hemorrhage. Case number 10. This 16-year-old boy presented with undescended testis. He had gynecomastia and was basically sent to locate the testis. You can see that the scrotum on the right side is empty. You can see the cord here. And you could easily identify the undescended testis on the right side. This was the empty scrotum so to speak and in the inguinal region the undescended testis was easily identified. On the left side the scrotum was again empty I couldn't see anything there just some thick skin or you know soft tissues there but to my surprise when I moved the probe cephalad to try to locate the left undescended testis this is what I saw. A very well defined uterus. You could see the endometrium there, the endometrium measuring about 9 millimeters. The left ovary with its follicles was very nicely identified. The right ovary could not be identified in the right adnexa. So, what are we dealing with? A 
right testis like structure with a rudimentary scrotum on the right side and a very well defined left ovary in the pelvis a uterus in the pelvis and the endometrium in the pelvis so the differential diagnosis was basically between a true hermaphroditism which is an extremely rare case and mixed gonadal dysgenesis this turned out to be a true hermaphrodite a very rare case as i said in true hermaphroditism you have unequivocal ovarian tissue as we saw on the left side and testicular elements and this is regardless of the karyotype in mixed gonadal dysgenesis you would have a differentiated gonad on one side but a streak gonad on the other side now all these things are important to assign a gender to this individual so that a decision for early gonadectomy could be taken and hence a biopsy is very essential apart from karyotype in these cases thank you very much